I was at the cemetery in a small village. Uh, it is Nisław Śląski in Polish or Langwaltersdorf in the time when the village belonged to Germany. I was a with a friend of mine who is a historian and it was really a gloomy day. It was gray and rainy and this old cemetery overgrown with vegetation. And Matteo, my friend, oh, he is a very talkative person. So he's talking and talking and suddenly I heard this story I haven't heard before. Uh, in 1829 is the beginning of the story of Anna Jungic. And the story is really gory. Um, Anna did an unimaginable thing. She killed her father and partially ate his body. Uh, before she did eat his body, uh, she made some very tasty sausages out of his body. It's terrible, isn't it? And the story was already read in my head. And this was how my character, my first character of Bitter Bitter Novel was born. Her name is Berta, Berta Koch, and she's a beautiful German girl who lives with her father. And then when, and then it would be a spoiler, so <laughs> I'm not going to say what happened with Berta and her father Hans Koch. But that was how my story was born. And I think this is the most important moment in the creative process. Uh, I think it's my hypothesis that the academic background gave me the ability to follow the line of a very complicated story. In some way, it is already in my head. I can see a very special structure uh, when I write. Uh, in this case, in the case of Bitter Bitter, the creative process was a little different. It was divided in four files, each one with the name of the main character, Berta, Barbara, Violetta and Kalina. And I was kind of surfing between these files, sometimes in the period of one hour, uh, I was surfing a lot of times between these characters. And I think for the writer, it's very, it's a very good thing, very enlightening and enriching to experiment, to give yourself the right to experiment. Uh, what I did uh, writing Goszko Goszko or uh, Bitter Bitter. And for me, the most difficult question is how do you do that? Such a huge narrative without having notes, uh, big, long novels with complicated uh, narrative structure. This is something I, I enjoy. Uh, actually, this story being completely fictional is my own emancipatory story. Uh, told in four female voices. Um, I had to do a lot of work to free myself from the limitations of my, of my habitus, of the way I, I was, the way the way of life my parents uh, thought was the best for a girl. And I had a lot of different emotions on uh, different stages of my life. And these emotions are personified by the characters of Goszko Goszko. Starting from Berta, the beautiful Berta who killed her father. Uh, it's anger, it's pure rage, 
it's a good beginning, I would say, not encouraging, of course, anyone to kill their fathers in literal sense. It's a good beginning, but it's not enough to free yourself to be a person, a woman uh, you want to be. So this is why we leave Berta in the same place she was born to, because she couldn't move forward. This is how I see uh, my past as a woman, as an academic, as a writer, as a feminist in Poland. Um, all of them, Amberta, Barbara, Violetta, and Kalina. I can distinguish two influences on this hard to uh, define. First influence, uh, is 100 years of solitude. I read as a very young girl. I was 16 at that time. I've never came back to this book, but I remember this moment, uh, which I define now as the moment when I started to understand the literary imagination that as a writer, one can create words that, as, that are as real as the hard actual reality. And second influence, maybe more important one, and for sure more uh, intellectually elaborated, is the influence of Japanese literature and uh, Japanese culture. I think in Japanese literature, um, for example, in Haruki Murakami's novels, uh, the line between reality and the other world, different world, is not as hard, as clear as it is in the so-called Western literature. It's one click, one moment, one phone call, and suddenly we are in this different world. Um, this is the quality I think I can feel in literary sense, and I in, incorporated it as my own. And it's something what appears in my narrative without, uh, of course, rational thinking like, oh, now we need a um, little bit of magical realism. And without this first uh, scholarship in Japan, I wouldn't be a writer, that's for sure. Uh, I was after my PhD. Uh, my field was um, psychoanalysis, the philosophical aspects of psychoanalysis and gender studies. So I did my PhD, I left for New York and it was time when I started to realize that the academic life um, was not really my thing. It was just a job. Um, it was a hard time, actually. And then this wonderful opportunity came out to go to Japan for two years. It was JSPS scholarship, postdoctoral scholarship. And so I went. Uh, and after these three stays in Japan, I, I am still deeply in love with Japanese culture, Japanese way of life. So everything in my life has something Japanese in it. What you need at the beginning is a story, a story you really want to tell. So very important. So look around if it is possible to find the room of your own, to fight for it if you need. Sometimes leaving everything you've learned behind, for example, everything you've learned from your parents. Sometimes to really tell your story in the way the story should be told, uh, you need separation, you need a distance to be far away from everything you know, and also to look at yourself from a different perspective. This is what Japan gave me, to see my reflection uh, and look 
at myself in a completely different way.